Hey, this is Matt. Once again, what about to the videos? The paid request is time for Sean. Thank you so much for that. And for those interested requests in any type of videos, topics, reactions, commentaries, what have you, feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both links are down below in the info box. And Sean wanted me to do a commentary on the 2008 film The Wrestler. So I will do the best that I can. And I'll pause at the beginning. Three, two, one. Pressing play. Now, this is a film I've seen a few times, and I do quite enjoy the film. It's not a film I have a lot of expert knowledge on, as in you know details behind the scenes and stuff. But I do like the film. Fox Searchlight, which anytime I think of Fox now, it's just <laughs> Disney owns them. Disney owns them. Um, Golden Lion, don't know what that is for a production company. But yeah, the wrestler, you know, we thought this would be the career resurgence of Mickey Wark. Sally, that didn't last long. I mean, he was in Iron Man 2. Of course, Darren Aronofsky, who's getting some traction nowadays because of The Whale, which I've not seen. But he's a director that I've liked some of his stuff. Requiem for a Dream I did enjoy. I'd probably say like it was this one, and really this one and the rest are the ones I like. The others, not so much. Do you like the song choice, Bang Your Head, for the theme of Mickey Ward's character? Bang your head. And it's interesting to see the whole backstory through all these promos and paperwork and pamphlets and stuff showcasing his history in the wrestling industry. The Ayatollah, of course, that's a bit like the 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 sheet, the Iron Sheet. You know, bit success in the ease, but now it's sort of broken down, and you know that's what happened to a lot of wrestlers. There's a lot of wrestlers that kind of in this state of flux where you know as they get older, they don't want to get out of the limelight. I mean, you say that's Ric Flair nowadays, honestly, and Hulk Hogan. Which I know Hulk Hogan made that story up of, oh yeah, Darren Aronofsky said I was going to be the star of The Wrestler. And the director's like, no, I never talked to him about it, so I don't know what the hell he's talking about. Hulk Hogan makes up a lot of shit. And Mickey Ward is a guy that just Drew to prominence back to the day, seeming like he was going to be one of those great premier actors in the style of Robert De Niro, you know, whether it be in films like Diner and even Angel Heart with Robert De Niro. But then, kind of his ego, his behavior, the way he treated other directors and such, it just got to the point where people didn't want to work with him, and then he got into boxing and stuff with plastic surgery, like mess up his face. So he just didn't have the natural good looks that he did back to the day. <clears throat> just really like screwed up his own career which is a very sad thing because
lot of familiar 80s songs in there. You know, some of these, you know, guys, like, they were big and famous, but then as they get older, they're more broken down. There's just not much that can be done. I mean, look at what happened with the, uh, I'm going to be bad with names, the Ugandan giant. Uh, how the hell did I forget his name? Oh, God, how can you... See, this is what I did when I do these commentaries, I always fuck up with the names. Kamala. I mean, this is a guy that was working programs with Hulk Hogan and such, and... Sally, like that guy, went through a lot of troubles and poor pay, and I think like one of his legs was taken off at one point. And Sally passed away at the age of seventy. But yeah, one of those guys that you know the they grew to prominence and fame, and then just Sally didn't work out for the best when they were older. Virginia just a damn shame. Like this guy, this guy was humongously successful in the 80s, this claim the fame, but issues and problems and all sorts of stuff. Now doing these independent promotions and trailer parks and And it's not just for wrestling either. Like, how many actors like fall on hard times? I mean, you almost say this is for Mickey Rourke himself. Like I said when he was growing up. I mean, man, just very prominent in terms of of, of acting and. tell you one of the I mean the reasons I like the film is I think Mickey Ward did a wonderful job acting in the film <laughs> he'll be playful with the kids you really felt sorry for the character you felt the heart on his sleeves on his shoulders also, the, the wrestling background was nice to be showcased, being a guy that you know, grew up liking wrestling back in the day. And you feel like the... Again, you, you with. I don't know, I keep seeing Mickey Ward, I just see such a. Just a missed opportunity as a guy that, you know, was for successful for, like I said, the di uh, Diner and Rumblefish and the Pope of Greenwich Village and Year of the Dragon and such. But then people just found it difficult to work with him. And he turned out a lot of roles. I mean, from... At one point he was up for Barry Hill's Cop. At one point he was up for Paul Fitchin, the Bruce Willis role. He just kept turning down all these big roles. And...
I think even Tombstone is up for role. He gets bad career decisions. I think some of these guys might be real wrestlers. And the independent circuit being showcased. And that's why it was kind of cool to see the behind the scenes of what these wrestling bits, how they might happen, how they might be showcased. Trying to look at the making of. So it was written by a guy who was a former writer for The Onion and entered development. With Nick Cage entering negotiations in October 2007, the star is Randy the Ram. That's what I mean, this sort of bad, this backdrop of how they call the match and the sort of info they give and the, what will be going out throughout the match. Uh, of course, the blading and how to hide it in order. See, pretty much blading is ways to hide it so you can get it out and cut to make it seem as you've been broken open. Some is on a wrist, some hide it in their tights, some hide it in various other places. Just where it's more convenient for people. And some are taped to their tights, all the other stuff. Of course, more the independent circus, some were called the mud shows. <laughs> mm -hmm. I said directors following this whole stuff to showcase a bit of the. Not the turmoil, but to really get into the crowd how excited they are for this whole thing. I was saying the, let's see, the following month Cage left the project but you were replacing him in the lead role. Cage pulled out of the movie because Aronofsky wanted Wart as the lead character. Cage was a complete gentleman understood that my heart was with Mickey Wart and he stepped aside. I have so much respect for Nick Cage as an actor, I think he could have worked with Nick, but you know, Nick was incredibly supportive of Mickey and his old friends with Mickey Wart. So that was really nice of him. So Hulk quoted Clay in 2012 on the Howard Stern show that he was offered the role, but he turned down because he felt he was the right man to portray the character. Aaron Ross disputed Hogan's claim, staying on his personal Twitter page that the role of Russell was always war, so it was never Hulk quoted as he claims on the Howard Stern show.
Of course, the fans being upset about it. <laughs> of course, found a way to the blade. Yeah. And we're, I mean, the director's doing a nice job showcasing this kind of fly on the wall aspect and not having music throughout it to really get the audience's reaction. And there wouldn't be music going on throughout a wrestling match anyway. It'd be more cinematic for a movie, but I guess to show, like, what you would see in a wrestling match. How these guys work with each other to act as if they're ready to kill each other. And this is the thing that you did see a lot of these older guys like Ric Flair still trying to do it and a whole code was doing it for a while. They just don't want to leave the spot the spotlight and also they feel like they have nothing left. They've been with wrestling for so long, it's like there's nothing else they feel they can do. So it's a 40 day shoot began in January 2008. 16 millimeter film throughout New Jersey. Scenes were also shot in the arena in Philadelphia. Afa Anoe, former professional wrestler, was hired to train Rourke for the role. The locker room scenes were improvised for work and us to look as if they were actually socializing. And that's the thing is that, you know, throughout, the way, when you look through this film, I know I'm not saying a lot because I'm just kind of watching and enjoying the film again as I'm viewing it. <clears throat> when you look at the other aspects of this guy's life, you could be looked at as a loser, or just things aren't going well, things aren't going the best. He wishes they're going the best, but it's quite the opposite. So instead, you know, this is the one place that he feels accepted, feels loved, feels like bigger than life, feels like a hero, feels like he's successful, is in that ring, in that locker room, in that ring. Because other than that, it's, you know, a kid who was disappointed in him then they tried to get back together because his dog everything's going with his daughter well and I remember there's this bit where he sleeps with a girl and blah 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 and oversleeps and is late and kind of ruins his chances with his daughter again. And then this bit where Marissa Tomei, like, she doesn't want him to do this, but it's like. He feels that all he has left is the fans of in wrestling. Like, that's all he. There's a lot of people, wrestlers out there, that feel that way.
Now, Marissa Tomei, of course, she's now known as Aunt May in the new Spider-Man films. Homecoming, Far From Home, No Way Home. Uh, she won an Oscar for My Cousin Vinny, the film with Joe Pesci. See, going throughout the credits, Clint Mansell, who worked on Requiem for a Dream and The Fountain, he did the score. Yeah, Bruce Bernstein saw in the is at the end credits. The Guns N' Roses song Sweet Child of Mine, which plays during Randy's re-entrance at the end of the film, apparently was donated for free to the film's modest budget, and Axl Rose donated for free. Throughout the soundtrack, you have two rat songs, Round and Round and I'm Insane. The Cry Riot song, Metal Health. It was Randy's entrance song except for the last match. Scorpion's on Animal Magnetism. Don't you what you got till it's gone we heard with Cinderella. You know, fun soundtrack, fun 80 soundtrack. WWE helped promote the film through an on screen angle. Oh yeah, with Chris Jericho criticizing people like Ric Flair. Criticized Ricky Ward for his portrayal in The Wrestler. Yeah, and then there was said there was going to be a match between Mickey Ward and Chris Jericho. But it's like, no, instead, he's not going to appear WrestleMania. He's just going to be a guest. Jericho faced Ricky Steamboat, Roddy Piper, Jimmy Stuck in a handicap match, and he, Chris Jericho won. But you War came in and punched Chris Jericho. And then Flair raised Mickey Ward's hand. So Aaron Opti says, Vince Man saw the film and he called both me and Mickey Ward and he was really, really touched by it. It happened a week ago. We were very nervous wondering what he would think, but he really felt the film was special. Having the support meant a lot to us, especially Mickey. Brett they had been hard, enjoyed the wrestler, and applauded Mickey Ward's clairvoyant performance, but called the film a dark misinterpretation of the business. Although the film speaks superbly to the speed bumps all pro wrestlers navigate, I'm happy to report most of us don't swerve off the road quite so severely. Jim Ross called it a really strong, dramatic film that depicts how people are obsessed with their own lives and their careers and can self-destruct. Mick Foley enjoyed the film and said, Within five minutes, I've completely forgotten I was looking at Mickey Rourke. That guy on the screen was Randy the Rain Robinson. Roddy Piper was said to have been highly emotional after watching the screen of the film. Aronofsky said of Roddy Piper he loved it. He broke down and cried in Mickey's arms, so he was psyched that the story was finally told. Ah, so there's a Russell Round Table on the Blu-ray release of the film. I gotta check to see if I have the Blu-ray of The Wrestler. I know I have the DVD. I've heard a lot of stories that there were a lot of these type of guys out there that's like, hey, sort of the, the old judge store. The own personal fucking judge store.
Okay, I think there's a bit of it on YouTube, just broken in the parts, so there's that. And this is one of those films I was, like, surprised they didn't get, like, more Oscars and stuff. But, yeah, the other people, like, Evan Rachel Wood plays his daughter. I'm like, where have I seen her before? It's just like, I know I've seen her before. I'm like, she was Madonna in Weird Al, the Al Yankovic story. Which I reviewed. I'm like, oh, that's right, okay. But I mean, after this, you think it was like, oh wow, he's got his comeback now. This is the film that really brought Mickey Ward back to the limelight. So then he's in Iron Man 2, and that didn't really do anything. He was in The Expendables in 2010, which he did a really good job with that. But then it was back to doing stuff like Java Heat and. Some of these other fucking films that no one watched or gave a shit about. And. I really just. Like, what the fuck happened? <laughs> now of course a lot of times you say is that really wrestling is more of the hardcore shit are you cool with the staples <laughs> but I mean this is a thing that does happen is that there are these type of hardcore matches like CZW and that type of stuff and that's not my kind of wrestling it's just not I mean I don't agree with Jim Cornette all the time, especially his political stuff I don't agree with, but I do, I get his understanding, and I kind of do agree with his thoughts on this hardcore wrestling shit, like this, this is like CZ, it, it is CZW actually, Combat Zone Wrestling, it's like, no one, okay, how did he phrase it, we spent so much time to not hurt anyone, but make the audience believe it's real. But now, you really are hurting people, but no one believes it's real. It's like the whole fucking reverse of the what it was supposed to be. It's like, oh, you're getting thumbtacks and staples and mouse traps and something bad in your fucking head. And no one believes in it. No one believed in the, the match. No one believed in what was going on. It was just... A bloodbath spectacle. And in my eyes, that's not wrestling. And like I perfectly get what you know Jim Cornette and other people feel about that. As so again, you're killing yourself, you're cutting up your body, you're losing blood. And yeah, I mean Mick Foley he he did some of that to be fair. But man, it was one of those things where 
it led to a lot of people doing a lot of stuff that you just go where's the limit and you know it just gets to a part of ridiculousness like you're going through all this stuff you're doing all this stuff but you're supposed to buy into it it's just I don't know I do think this is an interesting idea to show the results first and then show flashbacks of how that came to be so you see like the rest of the you see the wreckage and you see how that car accident happened But you imagine like some people who are into wrestling, they go, what the fuck is this shit? Like, what is this carnival, this uh, psychopathic bullshit with staples and forks in the foreheads and all that shit? But I did why Darren Aronofsky put it in there, because it is happening. It's, this is stuff that happens, this is stuff that people do. And there are sometimes people who are recognizable that go, do partake in this shit. Hell, you even see, seen some of the stuff in AEW with uh, Dean Ambrose was in CCW. Oh, I'm sorry, John Moxley, and then he, because he was at first in CCW doing this stuff. Then he went to WWE to be Dean Ambrose, and then he's in AEW as John Moxley. He's like bringing that shit back into it. And, you know, Chris Jericho and all these other people, you know, taking part in this. And, you know, even David Arquette. You know, in that movie, You Can't Kill David Arquette. You know, he kind of got, I mean, he accepted, to be fair. It's not like someone twisted his thumbs. But I don't think David Arquette realized exactly what it was going to be until it came to be, so to speak. But, uh. Yes, yeah, uh, uh, this is an interesting directing Teddy to show again the aftermath and then show how it came to be. Yeah, you know, I find that uh, interesting, at least to me. A good makeup effects too, like very good makeup effects and. This just really does make you feel for the character. I mean, granted, on one hand, they're doing it and they said yes to it. But again, you just go, damn. You just you just feel bad for where this these folks are and what they're putting their bodies through. And you're like, don't do that. <laughs> this is a reaction. Don't do that. Just don't do that. Is there the reality? At least I did. I mean, don't do that, man. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. But damn, man, damn, damn to damn, damn, damn. Yeah, you just feel fucking bad, which is the intention. And you just see this guy and where he's at in his life and just... There's all these scars and craziness and a lot of people put their bodies through this shit. And then you look at it and they get paid, you know, 15 bucks and maybe a gift card to Burger King. And you sit there and go, why? But it's this obsession with the work and the fan adulation. Of going out there and having so many people cheer you on. Oh, yeah. It's a addicting rush that people don't want to get out of or can't get out of. So there you go. And this is a little precursor to you know, the end of the film where he knows he's going to die. And he wants to die. I, I mean, the, the, to put it bluntly, he wants to die. Well, 
What's that song? I did it my way. I did it my way. Just how it is. Or how it was for him. As we see, like, Ric Flair is going on that same boat. When he had his last match and no one liked it. It was awful, terrible. And it's like, does Ric Flair want to be, like... It's like, Ric Flair is this guy. Like, this guy, I mean, this must be a biography of Ric Flair. And like, Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair put together. And of course, you know, you don't wrestle anymore. That's another thing. <laughs> of course, Jim Cornette criticized the film for being an unrelentingly depressing view of the professional wrestling world, saying it was neither... I know he says it's neither realistic or accurate of the profession for most wrestlers involved with it. Probably like the wrestlers he knew and he worked with. Um, but at the same time, I do think there's, there is a good sense of realism to it for a lot of people involved. Maybe not the people Jim Cornette talks to and worked with, but... It was in a lot of top 10 lists of the best films of 2008. Ruthless Reviews, At the Movies, Time Out, Entertainment Weekly, called it number one. Richard Roper, number four. Uh, yeah, a lot of people. It was nominated for Best Actor Oscars, nominated for Best. Actress Oscar, of course, they didn't win. He won the Golden Globe for Best Performance by an Actor in a Motion Picture. And he won the Independent Spirit Award. He won the Detroit Film Critics Society Award, Boston Society of Film Critics Award. I'm curious who won that year. Just curious. Sean Penn from Milk. Really? Mm. Oh, I mean. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think more people would remember Mickey Works Wrestler more than Sean Penn's Milk. That sounds pretty weird when I say it that way. <laughs> I'm just curious, what? One for best picture. Well, Darren Aronofsky wasn't even nominated for The Wrestler. It 
It wasn't even nominated for Best Picture. It was The Reader, Milk, Frost, Nixon, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button, and Slumdog Millionaire, which won. So yeah, this wasn't even nominated for Best Picture or anything. Well, just Best Actor, Best Actress, and both lost. Funny, a lot of these other festivals, the Mitty Work won for Best Actor and not, you know, Sean Penn Milk or whatever. And then won the Golden Globe, won all this, but Oscars, nah. Old school Nintendo. I think they did create a video game for this movie. Yeah, Russell Jam. So this was created specifically for the. Uh, Yeah, he's never heard any of this stuff. Yeah, this guy is so lost with the video games of today. Like for him, he's playing this simple Nintendo game where you're wrestlers. And I think... This kind of remind me of... Uh, the WrestleMania game for NES. It's, it's, sorry I don't have much to say I mean it's one of those films that kind of does speak for itself and I didn't grow up with it as a kid of course because it's a 2008 film and I've seen this film maybe three times or so but it's still a very good movie heartfelt performance by Mickey Rourke I mean if he could continue with roles like this, would have been great and nice, but Sally just wasn't the case. What did he do after this? Let me look at his filmography. I'm trying to work out. We saw previously Heart Ready Give Out, all building up to the finale of the movie. Okay, films like Passion Play with Megan Fox and Bill Murray, you know, let's see. Oh, Immortals. <clears throat> Which show me is a big budget film, says, so okay, let me take this big budget movie. You know, Java Heat. Which is. What the fuck was that movie again? Some lame, lame, lackluster, actual killing Lutz. You know, Black Gold. With Billy Zane, Tom Sizemore, Vivi Fox, Eric Roberts, and Michael Madsen. And Mitchell Work wasn't even on the fucking poster for the movie. There's like eight people on the poster, he's not one of them. 
I mean, just sadly, a lot of these, like, directed video films that really did nothing that wasn't seen, or if they were seen, they were seen in very low quality, and I just, people just didn't take him seriously, or maybe his, the way he behaved affected stuff as well. So he was in Nightmare Cinema, which is a horror anthology, and he played a guy who owned a theater, and the audience members witnessed a series of screenings. <clears throat> Sports drama named Tiger. A film called Blunt Force Trauma with Ryan Quentin. The Commando with Michael Jai White. Section 8, which I've heard of, with Ryan Quentin, Dolph Lundgren, Scott Atkins, Mickey Ward's in the bit role. I've heard bad things about that movie. Oh, and The Commando, Michael J. White, is a 3.3 in IMDb. I was checking through. And post-production, The Palace with Rowan Polanski, Murder at Hollow Creek, the Wheels of Heaven, Not Another Church Movie, oh god, what would that be? Three Days Rising, A Walkie Miracle, which is directed by Daniel Baldwin, of the Baldwins. I said, this is a guy that, you know, Diner, and Nine and a Half Weeks, and Angel Heart, and it feels like Barfly and stuff, and then just. Sorry, going through the trivia on IMDb now. Scott Siegel, the actor portrayed as the steroids dealer in the film, was arrested a few months after for steroids possession and assaulting federal officers, so I guess he really lived that role. The scene where a fan hands the ram a prosthetic leg and the ram hits his opponent with it is based on an actual event from an ECW show where a fan repeatedly yelled, Use my leg! and eventually tossed his leg to Tommy Dreamer, who in turn used it on his opponent. Only two days after the completion of The Wrestler was screened at Venice Film Festival and walked off with the Golden Lion Award for Best Picture, Major Warwick also would have walked off as Best Actor. The Venice Jury Chairman, Director Wim Wenders, had had his way, but Wenders' vigorous campaign could not topple a long-standing festival rule which insists that one film is not allowed to win both awards. Warwick happily contented himself with finally being the star of a prize-winning picture. Rourke was initially hesitant to be in the film because he wasn't a fan of the script or did he like pro wrestling. However, after Aronofsky let Rourke rewrite much of his dialogue, Rourke agreed to be in the film.
due to his errated nature and reputation, the original financing for the film fell through while Mickey Ward was the choice for the role. See. Sorry, I'm sorry I'm being silent, just looking through any trivia for this. Yeah, this seems like a very depressing state of affairs. I know Jim Cora mentions, man, when he saw this, he's like, I stopped going to these shows because I didn't want them to think of me as, oh, look at that broken down guy now. You know, yeah, one in a wheelchair, yeah, one pissing in the bag. Which, I mean, that is true that happened to some of these guys. I mean, look what happened to Kamala, or what happened to, you know, some of these other folks. Or they're sitting there kind of just waiting for someone to talk to them, someone to wait up to mention them. You know, it would be the Jake the State Roberts and all these other guys that just, from their own demons or other attributes, other things... And maybe for Bret Hart and Jim Cornette didn't happen in their neck of the woods, but for a lot of the people, because of their own self-destruction habits, it did. The movie ends when Randy come off the top row with the Ram Jam before going to black and playing a Bruce Springsteen song. When the match was filmed at a March 2008 Ring of Honor event, Ram nailed the move and scored the pin. The reason for the cut to black was to allow the audience to decide if he lived or died. So, that's up to you to decide. Well, during the director's AMA on Reddit, Darren Aronofsky revealed the fate of the Ram. He does, in fact, die at the end of the movie, so that's... What the director thinks. It is one of those things, though, that just... I think why it may also is just this film does just bring a sense of sadness to everything. I don't know how else to put it, just a sense of sadness to it all. Is this a... you call it a tragedy? 
You could easily call this a tragedy of this person, this character. God, this guy is such a fucking douchebag. Cause he doesn't know he's got power over this big. This is a guy, big, a little schlub of a man. Who knows that he could just fire the guy and has this power over him? And it's like, well, this guy ain't gonna do anything to me, cause I'll fire him. Where are you, balding fat fuck of a character? <sighs> uh, that guy should just do a fucking body slam, shove his head up someone's ass. Just die damn. It's hard to say much. It's just like I said, the just enjoying a good film, <laughs> just enjoying a damn good movie. That the wrestling backdrop is interesting to watch, but at the same time, when it's not, you just really just buy into this character, his loss of kind of just try drifting through life, but being good natured about it, and maybe trying to find his own way, but this. Obsessed with wrestling, realizing he's got really nothing left to it. While he has this nice girl, he maybe he knows either he'll screw it up sometime or something else will screw it up eventually, even though she's being nice to him. As a kid who's nine years old. You have a kid? Fuck this. You just, no, I'm just kidding. Fuck this. I'm gone. Bye. Fuck this shit. I ain't doing no kids. He's going to run away, driving his car. His van, I should say, and said, Fuck this shit. She said, oh, I'm going to sell this. Well, I guess I was just throwing the dumpster. That kid ain't going to know what the fuck that is. That kid's like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> that kid's like, what the fuck is this shit? Where's... You know, I thought it would be part of you. Where's Batman? I don't have a Batman figure? I'm sure you're working on it. Work on this stuff, is Tim. <laughs> uh. 
ground and ground. <laughs> <laughs> and now I have no room to talk because I can't see him for shit, but neither could they. But I think that's sure supposed to be the point of it, of course. No contact with the customers. <laughs> yeah, they don't work out. into the the whole deli sequence which I think I heard that this is some of it's a bit like improv ah, that fucking douchebag needs a girl punch in the mouth Does he have the, his right fucking name on the tag? Just fucking douchebag bosses. Just douchebag bosses. I do like I do like the the tracking shots. I do like what the director's doing here because he's showing the comparison between the wrestling life and the deli life. So you have the same type of similar entrance, but in that one he comes out to a crowd yelling, screaming, hero worship, that addicting feeling as if he belongs somewhere, as if he's a somebody, he's important. And now into the real world of just silence and customers and I remember reading somewhere that apparently in some of the deli scenes it was kind of on the fly imp improv of just him working the, the deli and reacting as natural as he can.
It reminds you a little bit of when Rocky had to do these type of jobs in the early Rocky films. I mean, he didn't do this specific job, but... Like in Rocky 2 when he had to clean up the, the whole stuff in there. And he, I mean, he's doing the best he can. He shows he's capable enough. <laughs> this might be one of those things that's a bit of improv. Yeah. Yeah, I would say this is probably the the improv that they're talking about this here. <laughs> I'm trying to have a little bit of fun in the workspace. So he gets to a point where he seems as if he's going to turn his life around and maybe things get better. He's going to work this job. He's going out with this girl. He's maybe getting in touch more with the, his daughter. And things just crumble down until he's like, fuck it, I got nothing left and I'm just going to... Because it's a self-destructive behavior that Sally, some, not all, but some of these wrestlers go through. I mean, Jake the Snake Roberts, uh, among other people. Sally for a bit. Uh, Scott Hall. Before he passed away. And other people, like, uh, this is more like the, that type of story. So, while, yeah, Bret Hart, the way he wrestled, and some of the people he was involved with, and Jim Cornette. They didn't experience that stuff, but there's the other side, the they had the self-destructive side, which there is a portion of that. I don't know if there's a lot of that nowadays. I don't know, but definitely back then, the from the 80s to the 90s, there were. I'm sure a lot of people that maybe Roddy Piper knew, Ric Flair knew, and them understood that a bit. And you say like Ric Flair, you see a lot of. Not all the vibes into this whole thing. I think also is this, uh, not melancholy, but this bit of, you know, no, remembering the film, knowing that, you know, this guy means well, seems like a very nice guy, treats the other wrestlers well, you know, other people, he means well, it's just, sadly, these few self-destructive habits just completely obliterate 
the good thing in his life where just for what I remember things go well here his, he tries to go out on a date again with that girl, other lady Marissa Tomei she says no again he gets you know upset gets drunk cocaine sleeps the entire day misses the dinner and things fuck up Like this one scene alone, Mickey Ward poured all of his soul into, and to be fair, I don't remember much of Milk, to be fair, but man, if that scene alone doesn't result in something special, I don't know what, what does. And man, there's that part of me that wishes this was a, you know, Guy gets his shit together, is able to overcome the odds, but I still think the the film he does very well done in aspects is trying to showcase as well. Is you believe everything Mickey Ward said in that scene? He's a he's a broken down piece of meat, and I deserve to be alone, but I, I just don't want you to hate me. And. Which is one of the things later on when he disappoints her and doesn't come and all that. And she's like, I hate you, you're full of shit, all this stuff. That leads into him pretty much leading to end in his life. I mean, that's really what it is when he goes into that wrestling ring and he knows he's not going to make it because of his heart condition. He knows it, so... So, maybe you'd call this sort of a sweet melancholy before... Before the fall. If you think about it. Sad melancholy. Or sweet melancholy before the sad fall. Which is too bad. And it's a uh, very... I mean, it is what it is. It is what it is. Like, man. It's tough. Definitely tough. And he didn't do it viciously, he didn't skip her day maliciously, it's just one of those things that happen. Because of the scene coming up here where he can't, he couldn't take the rejection and he goes, he flips out a bit, loses himself into drugs and booze and that fat stuff and... Yeah. 
Just uh Read what? Oh yeah, what's this letter now? It's like gold bananas. <laughs> she doesn't want to get involved because it could affect her job, affect the life of her kid because she needs a job, all this other stuff and yeah. And I'm trying to think like 2008 in film, what all came out in 2008? I mean Rambo 4 is my personal favorite film of that year. I saw that in the theater. It was a great experience. Love Rambo 4. Being a big Rambo fan except the last movie, which I thought sucked, but Love Rambo for Don't go with customers, I mean. Other stuff I enjoy Indiana Jones Team of Crystal Skull I liked, Hancock I liked, Iron Man, Wally. -E. It's that line he says, pretend you like me. And I think that's what he is upset about, is that, did he just pretend to like me? Did he just pretend to accept me? Did he just pretend to be my friend? So that type of rejection just hurts him a bit. Quite a bit, actually. But yeah, looking through t uh, 2008, yeah, Cloverfield I saw, I think I saw it in the theater and I liked Ramble 4. Love that. Trying to see what other team out in 2008. Diary of the Dead was pretty awful. 10,000 BC was pretty awful. Wasn't a fan of Doomsday. Uh, let's see. Prom Night Remake was pretty awful. So he had some bad ones, but Red Belt I remember lighting by David Bamet. Anyway, it doesn't matter. I mean, there's I mentioned some of the ones I already like, and really the only venue he feels accept is the the wrestling fans, the wrestling green, all that stuff. Really, the only bit that brings him happiness. Well, him and his daughter, and then his daughter will be gone, and then it'll be just this alone. Ah, uh, our truth Man. Cool to see our truth in there. I remember liking our truth. I mean, they just Sally just labeled him into comedy, so no one can take him seriously as a wrestler, even though he's talented. I think in the ring, it's just that he's so and he's good at it. To be fair, but he's just so much into the comedy now, and the twenty four seven hardcore belt and all that. But my bad. As Sally, now one no one ever takes him seriously because of that.
And of course, that's fake protein. I forget the what's specifically used for that. <laughs> uh. Yeah, this is night of fun. Yeah, this definitely ain't his bedroom. I think the paint covers and the shirtless men give it away. <laughs> And Ricky Ward was still got in pretty damn good shape in this, I will say that. Got in really good shape. How's that? Oh. <laughs> was a fucking raccoon, a squirrel or something? The hell was that? Animal of some sort, obviously. And she just left him there. I just sure that he wasn't just gonna fucking steal shit. <laughs> oh, this is where he sleeps a whole day and fucks up and is like, oh shit, and misses his his beating with his daughter. He didn't think twice about it. That's the thing, too. He didn't think twice about it until too late. Now, uh, how long is it going to take for him to realize it? Because he thought himself first and foremost. Put himself, ego, whatever it is. Then take into consideration other attributes. Yep. Too late now. And this is where he's going to get the verbal beating of his life because he fucked up his uh, fun, love, whatever you want to call it, drug night of fun, took his toll and screwed everything up. Because he thought of himself before his daughter. can't really blame her because he says all this impassioned speech and then the first thing they meet he disappears or he doesn't show up he's like what the fuck like really you were so gunno about this and now you know you, you miss this like what the fuck is the deal here so I can't I can see her point of view and can't really blame her too much for her reaction so she got a point Like I said, I can't really blame her, her thinking. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was, uh, fucking a lady and in a bathroom, and I got high on cocaine and booze, and so I slept the whole day, and... <laughs> like, come on now. That shit ain't gonna fly. Ain't gonna fly high like a kite in the sky. Yeah, get pissed all you want, dude. She wants nothing to do with you. She says, fuck off. You lost the battle, you lost the war. Time to pack it in, call it a day. I just talked a little bit about wrestling, like since it's the wrestler I grew up watching a bit of wrestling from back in the day as a kid didn't have wrestling on the channels but would have a tape that my aunt would send us and one had a tape that the people around at the time was Razor Ramon and Doink the Clown and Skinner and IRS and the Berserker, Undertaker, and so forth. 
other than that, there was a couple of VHS tapes we had, some of Hulk Hogan, and some of, like, Best of WrestleMania, or Best of this. It was those big, bulky, like, what was it, Coliseum Home Video releases? It was a like black and, and bulky, like, big box. And... That's really all I knew about wrestling until, I guess, the early, not, not, uh, the late 90s. The late 90s, early 2000s, we had cable and was able to finally watch some of the Attitude Error. Some of the WWF and WCW and go back and forth to see a bit of WWF, then a bit of WCW, go back and forth. And see a bit of that stuff going on. And then... After, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin was gone, Dwayne, you know, The Rock, which I did enjoy, he's gone and all that stuff, it kind of... God, this lady just... This girl just fucked with him now. A little more, a little less. Make up your fucking mind, lady. Make up your fucking mind, lady. Them people just fuck with them. <laughs> but yeah, I was saying the. Uh, after Stone Steve Austin was gone and The Rock went to Hollywood, I kind of lost a lot of interest. And just really did not give a shit about the, the new guard. At least, you know, John Cena, I didn't care for. Triple H was around, I really didn't care for him. So, John Cena, Triple H, double feature, I just wasn't for me. I, I went away from wrestling for a long, long time. Lawn fucking time. It's a lawn fucking time. And... It's almost a little like he jammed his finger in there on purpose. I mean, I know it's supposed to be an accident, but it looked like he jammed it in there on purpose. Where he went like this. Maybe it was sort of like the kickstart him to finally quit in the job. It's like, you know what, I'm going to do this to make this big explosion of blood and finalize me quitting this fucking job. But yeah, I, I had not seen wrestling after that for a long upon long ass time. And after that, I just would peek in it from time to time. And then there was an era that kind of got a bit more back into it. Did like some of those DVDs. Like I have a series of wrestling DVDs around here. Like, uh, well like these here. You know, there's a Starcade, and I have a series of stuff here, which is, you know, the rise and fall of WCW, and, you know, the Hardy, Madden Jeff Hardy, 
kind of like random DVDs I would find out in the the world, and got a little bit more and more back into the the whole steam of things of seeing these wrestling stuff. I think I got like the Bret Hart one and other stuff out there, so just got a bit more into it. And then nowadays I don't watch, I haven't watched wrestling in years and years. And the only way I know about the product nowadays is Jim Cornette's podcast, which I don't agree with them politically, but uh, I do enjoy his wrestling mind. I do enjoy a lot of stuff that he talks about and says. And I said, I do quite enjoy a lot of that stuff. So there you go on that front. I do enjoy a lot of that, so. But I do enjoy, the wrestlers I enjoy was like Stone Cold Steve Austin, Bret the Hitman Hart, Macho Man Randy Savage. I would say those are my top three wrestlers. Roddy Piper would be in there. Um, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. The Rock is a good wrestler. I, I would put him in that list. I have to think about it more. I do like Mick Foley, among other other folks. Diamond Dallas Page, I also enjoy. But anyway. So now he's going back to the one spot that he knows he's loved and respected at with acceptance. And they don't go into like a backstory of his childhood or anything of the sort. It's just... I think that guy was a wrestler as well. The guy who plays the Ayatollah. I could be wrong, but I think that's the case. Well, I guess, you know, now that I think about it, if you want to see a bit more of Ant May, this is the movie to do it. <laughs> like that right then and there. And the real attributes of Ant May. <laughs> Which is crazy to think about. It's like you see this wide shot of her naked ass and titties I'm like that's gonna be Aunt May in a few years <laughs> you know well more than a few years like a decade later but yep hey Peter Parker here's your Aunt May what if Tom Holland's ever seen The Wrestler is that bip? There's your Aunt May. I think at this point he kind of knows that he's not going to make it. I think he knows right then and there that this is going to be kind of his final countdown, his final stand. Maybe he's counting on it because for him and his eyes he has nothing left to live for.
How much was it? Ten dollars or something? I forget what he said. Gotta be more than that. Maybe he said a hundred dollars. I can't remember what the hell he said. Yeah, things ain't going to end the best here. Not at all. So this is a guy really resign, resigning to his fate. That whole line that he could just say, nope, walk away and maybe be with her, but as he puts it, no, this, this is where I belong. Like for him, he views like either I go out there and I either get beat down by a shitty boss or work a job that I'm not happy with or even with Marissa Tomei how long will that last will it last a week a month a year a daughter who hates him for him he feels this is the only place he can truly be happy and I guess in his eyes die a legend of course Marissa Tomei is not going to stay around he's not going to watch him kill himself This is people, this is family, this is the people that, uh, that, again, that he will worship, everything in between. For him, this is where he belongs, this is where he uh, all has left, and that's just all there is to it. So he's really just signing his death note, knowing this is the case.
<laughs> Definitely a take on the, the Iron Sheet, among other stuff. <laughs> I'm sure it was like the idea was like when Hulk Hogan versus the Iron Sheet that type of thing. That was sort of the the idea of these two caricatures. Anyway, that speech kind of reminds me of when Ultimate Warrior made his speech before. Like he made that speech to the WWE audience, and then soon after he died. This is another guy that had a lot of issues and problems and personal beefs and didn't seem like the nicest guy though. He's <laughs> going through the last remnants of you know his final match. For the crowd to love and support in the Reign of Honor arena. And there's the first rumblings where things are not going in that well. Because I think there's even a bit where the Ayatollah, you know, the guy realizes something's wrong. He's like, just pin me, just pin me. And he's like, nah, I'm going to end it my way. Do his finishing move, and I say he knows. I think part of the, he this is where he realizes. This is why he's like, just pin me, man, just pin me, and it's like, yeah, this is when he knows something's wrong, something's off. But this guy pretty much is, uh, he wants it to end. You just say he wants to end, he wants to end this way because he doesn't want to be out there because he can't face that world. I mean, in a way, it kind of, if you think about it though, it's kind of a, in a weird way, a shitty message of this guy just gave up and what well, you want to call him a coward, call him a weakling, call him something else to the effect. That this guy didn't fight his way to better his life, didn't fight his way through his problems, didn't fight his way, and instead just easily succumb to it. Where it's like, you know what? This person told me he's giving me an out. Let me fight my way to try to have a better life and maybe find a better job without a dickhead boss. And you know that you could view it that way as well. I'm not saying that's how I view it, but I'm saying someone could easily view it that way in that fashion. He kind of knows this move is going to be the, the end of it all. The crowd, the adulation, the love. And there you go. And you got the Bruce Springsteen song, which I like Bruce Springsteen. I remember not mining the song. We have Mickey Ward, Marissa Tomei, Evan Rachel Wood, Ernest Miller, yeah, I think he was a, a wrestler in real life. Uh, Ron Killings, there you go, know, R-Truth. Verbal, yes, it's, it's a very tragic movie, kind of a, a sad movie, from all I've heard. Seems like to have a precursor to The Whale, which came out recently. 
and uh, yeah, as it is, I still really enjoy the film. I definitely think it's one of the director's best movies. I think Mickey Rourke easily gave one of his best performances of his career, by far. Well acted, some great tracking shots of the camera following the, the characters, whether the entranceway going to the ring, been getting up and up close and personal during the wrestling segments without being confusing or off kilter. And overall, just a very good, satisfying movie. In, uh, in my opinion, at least. So with that said, uh, thanks for watching. Take care. Thanks once again, Sean. And we'll see you guys later. Bye-bye.